Okay, so uh, good morning. Uh, I appreciate your accommodation for a later start this morning. Uh, today, we're going to be continuing on our discussion of monads and uh, specifically hitting on uh, a couple features of monads that we alluded to last time, but uh, didn't have a chance to really explicate, um, or at least to not to, to my satisfaction. Uh, we're going to try to make a little bit more concrete some of the monad uh, laws that come out of adjunction triangle, inequal triangle equalities. Um, uh, we had briefly seen that before, but uh, some of the notation is uh, quite dense and it's, uh, it's real meaning to you may, uh, may be elusive. And we're gonna be looking at uh, how it applies to a set of particular functors um, using different ways of, of indicating the notation to try to make it more concrete. And particularly we're going to look at this uh, interaction between on the one hand, the uh, from, from a category theoretic standpoint, uh, monad uh, operations of two sorts. Number one, uh, a uh, unit operation, um, sometimes called pure in a programming context, uh, particularly in reference to applicatives. Um, this is uh, uh, the the operation which is a natural transformation guaranteed by by adjunctions by all adjunctions um, and uh, secondly we're going to look at the interaction of that with uh, mu the other natural transformation that is guaranteed for any adjunction uh, which is often called flatten or join within a programming context. And we'll see how eta, the, uh, the unit, the pure return, as it's often called in a programming context, serves as the unit element of a monoid uh, dictated by the, um, by the multiplication, the mu. We saw last time that those emerged from adjunctions. And in fact, any adjunction as noted has associated with it uh, a monad uh, dictated by R and then L um, and a comonad from L and then R. Uh, and it has these two natural transformations, eta and epsilon. And uh, through defining those, one can actually arrive at a formula for uh, the the join operation. Today, we're, we're not going to be delving again into that um, adjunctions perspective so much as just accept to note that um, these elements derive from adjunctions. What we're going to see is their more concrete manifestation for, uh, for practical monads to try to give you a concrete sense of what some of this notation means. The second thing I was hoping to do uh, today was to to pay off a bit of uh, technical debt through coverage uh, of a topic uh, associated with natural transformations that has been kind of in the background when I'm applying natural transformations and, and really is hard to ignore. Um, it's almost in the foreground when we're dealing with uh, triangle equalities for adjunctions and uh, by extension, by, by direct mapping, these monad laws that come from them for monads. And um, we're gonna specifically define two types of composition for natural transformations. One of them termed vertical, trans, uh, vertical composition um, and uh, where we have uh, two functors, uh, both going from say category C to category D, and we can vertically compose them to create another functor from category C to category D. Um, but uh, there's, in the context of adjunction triangle equalities in the context of monads, there's an even more important uh, form of, of natural transformation or more prominent, I should say, form, which is horizontal combination of natural transformations. 
And um, you may get a feel for why we use this terminology, but basically this involves composing functors, not between, not between C and D and C and D to get a functor between C and D, but, but from C to D and D to, to category E, uh, composing those and getting a functor from category C to category E, end to end. And uh, we can do this, um, and uh, it's fairly straightforward, but conceptually it can be a bit uh, elusive. And uh, so I, I tried to explicate some of uh, what Bartosz talked about in, in uh, one of the videos you would have seen uh, to, to also illustrate it in a component-wise fashion, which is a bit of a, a bit busy, but, um, but communicates, I think, fairly well what's, uh, what's going on there when we compose these natural transformations. The third thing I was hoping to do as time allows here was to talk about three ways in which we can express monads programmatically, uh, all of which are equivalent. Number one, um, and most common within a category theoretic context, using these natural transformations I just mentioned, uh, this multiplication or mu, also termed, uh, termed to join or, or, or flatten, in a, uh, in a programming context on the one hand, and secondly, return or pure or unit, uh, pick your choice of names, the thing that ejects traditional values into the monad. That's one way of doing it. Uh, all three of them share this return, pure, pure uh, unit, whatever you wanna call it, um, element but they differ in what the other one is that complements it. The first is join um, or flatten, if you will. Uh, the second one uses Kleisley composition, the fish operator. Uh, and here we're dealing with an operator that can string together these, these effectful functions, these functions that take in a value that's traditional, but return a value possibly embellished with some computational effects. For example, a value that uh, might not be uniquely defined or might, might sometimes never return any particular value or which, uh, which might be associated with a side effect or which might uh, be associated with the distribution of possible values. These are all characterizing possible computational effects and these um, arrows in the Kleisley category capture these functions which take a traditional value and return an effectful uh, value. They're effectful functions. And uh, they return values uh, embellished by these effects. And uh, here the, the fish operator strings together any two of those arrows to form a third arrow that's an effectful function. Um, takes in a traditional value and returns a, an embellished value, a value that can have some effects associated with it. Um, so that's the second way of defining uh, monads. The third way is the most popular way in a programming context, which is with this operator bind um, or flat map uh, within um, other uh, programming circles, uh, which uh, kind of provides an, an abbreviated form of, of Kleisley composition where you've already got the result of the first effectful function and uh, you wanna combine it with a, to be processed by a second effectful function uh, to return a embellished value. So these are three ways to defining monads. And, and if we get to it, we'll try to, uh, to hit on, on all three of those um, while giving ref reference back to things like the Kleisley category. So, so that's a bit of our plan for today. Um, I'm gonna switch over to my slides here and we will get started. Okay, um, so just as a reminder, we saw last time um, some motivation in the form of wanting to capture computational effects. And uh, we noted that in the imperative context, um, capturing these is sometimes uh, trotted out as kind of a reason that you know, from a pragmatic standpoint, 
we really can't do functional programming. You know, it's unrealistic. We, we really need a more flexible mechanism like, like comparative programming. And needless to say, I believe that's incorrect. And I believe that ultimately um, one sacrifices um, uh, diverse components, including eventually um, uh, a lot of opportunities for performance, uh, parallelization, and uh, comp uh, compositionality and, and uh, composability of your programs and uh, modularity, et cetera. But it's an old chestnut one hears on the, in the imperative side. And uh, these effects, there's no question that capturing computational effects, whether it's the ability to do logging or to capture side effects or to do input output or, or to characterize partial functions, um, to, to carry around values that are in some sense context dependent or that are non-deterministic or, or have functions that are non-deterministic. Um, uh, the, these are things that, um, you know, unquestionably at a pragmatic standpoint, we need to be able to do. But one of the realizations within the context of, um, of, of, of functional programming and, and those who thought more deeply about computation more generally is that, look, we can, we can capture uh, these effects um, in ways that are still functional, that are still pure, that, that still allow for equational reasoning, still allow for rigor in analyzing a program, still allow for composability, still allow for, um, for very, very well-defined contracts uh, in terms of input output. And specifically, we can do so using these, these constructs we've seen from the, one of the first couple lectures of this, um, this group, which is uh, the use of functors. And the idea here is, look, well, you know, we're, we're in say category Hask, or it's a, a pseudo category, but it, it, it's approximately category. And um, maybe we're the equivalent one for, for uh, Scala. And here we might have a type and uh, with a functor, we can create a kind of an embellished version of that type, right? So, so going from a float, we could create a maybe a, a, a list of floats, um, uh, and alternatively, maybe we uh, pair up a float with a string if we want to do logging. Um, maybe we create a set of floats. So, if we have a functor that maps from type to type. Um, uh, so, uh, sorry, here, this is from has to has, excuse me, from has to has. The functions here are going from type to type, um, but we have a function going from has to has. Uh, it may map, for example, float into lists of float or float into pairings of a string and float or float into a set of a set and float or float into a distribution of floats um, with finite number of, of possible non-zero uh, probabilities. So this maps a type into kind of a embellished or generalized or extended or elaborated, whatever value you want to use for it, something of type C. It's still, it's still floaty, but it's it's um, you know it's it's got this other stuff um, that takes it beyond what a strict single float value can normally give you. Um, it may be a, a maybe a float, in which case it it could be you don't have a float value at all. Um, uh, so here, you know, we will sometimes say we've supplemented C with greater flexibility, right? Um, we've we've lent it some extra flexibility, um, and and that's great about functors. So we can turn a float into a list of float or into a maybe a float. Great. Uh, so. So, so that's um, that's a, a step. Um, any old functor can do that. We don't need a monad to do that. Um, but functors can do more than that. Remember, uh, a functor, its job in life is to map just not not just objects, not simply objects. It, it maps functions. Um, and in this case, we have functions from one type to another, right? From float to int, for example, like the ceiling function or from int to bool, like is even. Um, and um, we, with a functor, 
we can lift such functions. Um, so if we have something that turns a, a type, any old type A into a list of A, we can take something that goes from say into bool, let's say is even, and turn a list of int into a list of bools. That functor, the list functor, operates not only being able to turn a float into a list of floats, that is an object, but it can operate on these functions. It can turn a thing that maps from int to bool to something that maps from list of int to list of bool. It can operate on lists as a whole, right? Um, that's what functors do. And so by extension, a, a functor that can capture partial values, uh, partial functions rather, uh, functions that may or may not return a value, uh, could map from something that's, you know, a uh, uh, possibly missing value of type int to a possibly missing value of type bool. And I show some examples of this uh, here where we are mapping something um, from one type A to another type B, but where it's embellished values of A and embellished values of B. And we can simply map it through. And it's, you know, it's conceptually uh, fairly routine to think about this. So if we want to go from, for, uh, for example, a list of events to a list of bools by mapping with is even, um, then all we do is we chunk through the list. First element of the list, we ask if it's bool, uh, sorry, if it's even. And that produces our first bool in the return list. We go to the next element of the int list and we ask, is that even? And, and that becomes the next bool in the return list. We just kind of, we go under the list and apply it to each element in turn. So by lifting a function, we sometimes talk about as going kind of under the functor. It's applied element-wise. And that's not a bad intuition to have, although it has some limitations associated with it. And uh, so if we have a set, we map all the elements of the set with our function f from type A to type B. That will give us something, a function that goes from set of A to set of B. Any set of A we can turn into a set of B by lifting this function um, and applying it element-wise. Same thing with the list, same thing with a maybe. They go under it and apply to the elements. Um, now, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, you know, useful. Um, if you think about this, let's, let's talk about a list, for example. Maybe we have this list here. Um, and, you know, if we have this thing is negative here, which um, I've used as, uh, as kind of my function from int to bool. Um, now we're going to apply it from t of int to t of bool, where t is our, uh, it's going to be our monad, but, but here it's just a, it's a plain old functor can do this. So um, uh, t is list. And uh, we're going to apply is negative to each element of the list to get out a list of bools, right? So we have a list of int. So we have a function from int to bool, and we lift it to be a function from list of int to list of bool. And we just do so by applying it element wise. Um, and, uh, and that gives us our list of bool, which is what we want. Similarly, if we have a, a, a maybe a functor, uh, we can use that to lift is negative to take a maybe event and to turn it into a maybe a bool, right? So, so just three will become just false. Uh, it goes, the, remember this functor, this function f is negative goes under the functor, right? It applies to each element. So three turns into false and it sits inside the just. Um, minus three turns into true by is negative being applied to the minus three to get true. Um, for nothing, we get nothing out. Um, and this functor maybe has lifted this function so that instead of just being a function going from uh, 
in Tabool. We've extended it to apply to map from maybe events to maybe a pools. And really that's what functors give us. So we have this ability to extend it, um, extend it on to these, to these elaborated values. And you could think of a similar thing with a writer, which, which might capture some needs with, um, with uh, logging. Um, and here we're mapping this element, not the string. The string is kind of just baggage that's embellishment. We're, we're mapping the core thing, the int here. Um, power set, we get similar things, but, but this is where this notion of kind of going under, you have to, you have to be a little bit careful because um, here we have this set and we could think of it, it, we could be excused for thinking of this function is negative as kind of going under the set and being applied to each of these values, fair enough. So the first one will give us true. The second one will give us false for whether it's negative. Whoa. The third one will give us false. Fourth, false, false, true. Um, but I mean, you could think of it as, as having a set, you know, true, false, 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 true. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's really the sad, true and false. I mean, any duplicates are just folded into it. So we get out the set true, false from this. That's the result of lifting this, fu this function is negative to operate on on sets, right? Um, but lifting lets it go from set to set. Great. Um, this is a, a, a power set events that we're considering and we can map to a power set of bools. Um, probability distribution, it's even a little bit more, you've got to be, again, the same intuition. You got to be a bit cautious here because here we ask is negative, right? Um, and forgive me for labeling this in a way that's not entirely clear, but what this is saying is we have two with probability 0.1, minus three with probability 0.6, and we have five with probability 0.3, okay? So these are um, the, the things after the colon or the probability associated with the thing before the colon. So this is a distribution of three possible values uh, each associated with the different probability is indicated by the value after the colon. Okay, now, if we map it with this negative, uh, now we get something where, yes, we could map each one. So it's two, negative, false. It's, it's, it's not negative. Minus three is a negative, true. Um, and, uh, oh, um, oh, mumble, mumble, mumble. This should be uh, the other way, shouldn't it? Um, so, um, this should be 0.6 here. Um, this is the easiest way to do it, I think. Um, so, so if we think about it, you know, two, uh, is it negative? No, it's it's not negative. Uh, so that contributes 0.1 for it. Uh, minus three is that negative? Yeah, that's minus. Uh, that's negative. So true gets 0.6. So far, we've got a running total of 0.1 for, for false. And then we have five. Is that true? Um, uh, oh, sorry, is that negative? No, it's, it's not negative, it's false. So that accrues another 0.3. So we have a total probability that's totaled up of 0.4 for false and uh, 0.6 for true. Um, so here we had is negative led to you know, mappings of multiple ints into, you know, a false. Um, uh, here, two and five were mapped to false. And so instead of, we don't just, you know, uh, mindlessly just write down additional values, false 0.1 comma false 0.3. No, no, it sums it up. It, it, it adds it up. It, it, um, it, uh, it joins together, totals up all those probabilities that that map to the same, same value. And so, so this is the result of lifting is negative into the distribution domain. You get the semantics kind of summing up the probabilities, which is kind of interesting and it has to be that way. Um, so this is a legitimate distribution. Whereas if you just strung out those other possible values for 
multiple possible values for false associated with probabilities. It wouldn't be a valid distribution. So this is lifting. And again, at a fair degree of approximation, it's not a bad intuition to have that lifting a function puts it under the monad. It applies it to each element within limits here. Okay, we're gonna come back to that. But this is for any old funk door. Now we got to um, take a look at monadic context. So this is for any old functor. We could do wonderful things with functors. We could elaborate values. We could, and, and that extends the values in some sense, generalizes them. We could extend functions so that they operate on these embellished values these elaborated or generalized values. And now we have generalized functions and that's great. These uh, generalized functions kind of mirror the semantics applied um, with normal functions, but, but operate on values. Um, and so, you know, the overall plan of action here is to, instead of relying on just plain old um, functions, uh, we want to have functions that can return values to indicate these computational effects. And then we wanna string them together. And that's the key area where monads come in. We wanna compose them. So we might have um, you know, functions that return values with strings associated with them or functions that return uh, functions that take in a state and return a state or functions that that can uh, that can be an element of value B or nothing at all, um, not just a single element of the return value, but they could be nothing or a power set of possible values, of, you know, a set of possible values, not just one or distribution, et cetera. And all of these, this is all realizable with functions, but what we wanna do is string those together. And, um, and really monads allow that. I wasn't planning to, to jump to it right now, but just to complete this thought, um, yeah, there's a lot coming up. Um, we have this Kleisley category. And in the Kleisley category, we, we can precisely string them together. We we're gonna, we saw this last time a bit, but basically in the Kleisley category, the arrows from int to bool, for example, are not just plain old arrows, uh, plain old functions that take an int to return a bool. There are functions that take an int to return an embellished bool. So maybe it's a uh, set of bools, for example, um, or maybe it's a maybe of bool. And uh, this Kleisley category will be specific for a certain monad. So we'll have a monad for maybes and int to bool arrow over here in the normal categories, this is our normal, say, hask, will correspond to um, Int to, into maybe a bool. Um, and if we have an arrow from bool to float, it'll be, uh, it'll correspond to functions take in a bool and return a maybe a float. So these arrows are, um, are defined with um, these embellished functions that we were just, of which we just spoke. These are these embellished functions. And what's important is that we can compose those embellished functions. We can, we can string them together. We can um, take an F star that goes from int to maybe a bool and, and take a G star that goes from bool to maybe a float. And we wanna form them together to something that goes from an int to a maybe a float. Um, and Monads give us exactly that ability. That's exactly what monads bring to the table. Whether they are defined in terms of join and return or pure or unit, uh, or whether they're defined in terms of Kleisley composition, which is exactly that operator turn an F star and a G star into a Q star um, here. Um, or whether they're defined in terms of bind and return, they uh, they give this ability. 
Um, all those are, are interchangeable. You could define one in terms of the others. So um, here we have uh, uh, we have three ways of, of writing monads. And um, we're going to be concentrating on this one to continue our, our narrative uh, from, from last time. But uh, we're going to be exploring uh, some of these others more uh, in, in coming lectures. But um, let's, let's go to this, uh, to this one, which we talked about last time, where we had two operations that come directly out of adjunctions, mu and, and return or unit um, in a category theoretic concept, also called bind. Um, and I want to remind you, this was called um, eta, and mu was this one. And, and we talk about mu, uh, eta being the unit and mu being multiplication um, in ways that we alluded to last time, but I don't think I really gave an adequate, uh, an adequate um, sense of that. So eta, eta's job in life is to take a traditional element and inject it to become an effectful element or an element that's embellished, that's generalized. Um, so for a list, for example, it, it would create a singleton list of that element, okay? Um, for maybe it'll create, if you give it an int, it'll create a just of that int. So you give it three, it'll create just of three. A list would, the list eta would, if you give it three, you would create a singleton list with, so a list with just the element three in it. With a writer, we, it would pair up, it would be a pair of values, the first element of which might be a string, and the second element of which would be three. Um, for power set, it'll be just the set, it, that's the, the eta for a power set will return the set of three. And Eta is the function that takes in the normal value, like three, and gives you this embellished value, this generalized value. Um, and these things are not arbitrary. We'll see it has to be this way. Um, they have to be defined this way to be consistent with the monad laws. We'll get to again in just a minute. We saw them a bit last time. With probability distribution, um, here we take in a value three, and we return a Dirac delta function um, centered on that value. So it has the value three with probability one, and there's no prob there's no chance of anything else happening uh, for either. It, it's just right of three, et cetera. So these are these are things which inject a traditional value into the monadic domain. So it 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 creates, it, it takes a, a thing of type A and it creates a T of A, where T is the monad, okay? Um, and, but it's a very specific thing. It's a very particular one. Um, and specifically, um, one, one property it certainly has to have is that it's a natural transformation. It needs to be that it's, it's, it's natural. And uh, the naturality here is indicated with our, our normal naturality square. So look, if we, if we start with a int um, and we can either inject it in to become a singleton list of ints and then ask, and, and then lift is negative to apply to turn that into a singleton list of bools, right? Um, we could do that. Uh, F here was, is negative and uh, we could have this standard old int three. We get a singleton list of just one element of three in a list. We lift, we apply is negative to map a list of ints, a list with just one three in it into a list of bools. So it's gonna turn into false, a list of false, and we get out a list of false. Alternatively, um, we, we need to be able to go uh, this other way equivalent and it needs to be equivalent that we just immediately apply before turning it into a list of anything. We ask three, are you negative? And we get a bool. And then we inject that 
by our eta to become a list of pool, that has to give exactly the same value. This is the naturality of, of, of eta that has to be guaranteed. So we need a natural transformation, um, a polymorphic function, that's what this is, which will, which will uh, take in an A and return a T of A, where T is the monad, uh, an instance of the monad, um, such that this naturality is guaranteed. Now in Haskell, that's automatically guaranteed for any parametrically defined polymorphic function. Um, so uh, this is something which uh, you know, is, is insured there. In a category theoretic concept uh, context, uh, it needs to be insured, but you may recall eta pops directly out of adjunctions. Um, you get a natural transformation automatically from any valid uh, adjunction. Um, and uh, we, we saw in fact, how that could be defined. It's guaranteed to exist by virtue of, of a self loop that, um, that occurs over in the other category um, from which you're mapping. Uh, and, and we saw that last time. So uh, we're, we're always guaranteed to have a legitimate natural transformation of this sort that comes out of any adjunction. So here um, we need data to be natural, but that's, that's ensured in, in the Haskell context. Uh, but there needs to be an additional property. And, and this property relates to the monad laws we're about to, to recall, but um, it, it specifically relates to how eta and mu interact, okay? So eta and mu have this role they play with respect to each other. Mu acts as a multiplication. It multiplies it multiplies uh, these these uh, values uh, associated with the uh, the monad, and specifically, it removes or adds these levels. It it removes these levels of um, of nesting associated with T. Um, but it needs to treat eta as a, a unit in this context. That if you combine it. Um, you, you will get the same value out. Um, so uh, you need to be able to interchangeably capture that. And to explain this, I need to, to explain what mu is. So here, um, if we have list, for example, mu, the natural transformation mu, which also came out of the adjunction, as we saw last time, it's going to be a natural transformation that takes a list of list of A into just a list of A. And how does it do that? Well, it's going to flatten it it's gonna take this list of lists and it's gonna flatten it down. And, um, uh, okay, um, uh, mumble. I, I thought I might have a nice nice example of it, but um, so uh, maybe the list of lists is, you know, the, the it's, a, it's a list, each of whose elements are lists. So the, of the entire list, maybe the first element uh, is one, two, three, and the second element is four, five, six, uh, is the list four, five, six. Um, so, so this is a list composed of the list one, two, three, and the list four, five, six, and we we flatten them with mu, and we get a list of single list of one, two, three, four, five, six. Great. Maybe we'll take a, a maybe of maybe something that maybe a uh, maybe event, and we'll turn it into a maybe event. And semantics associated with this, um, if you think about it, end up being fairly clear. If the outer thing is nothing, then we have nothing. Uh, the result is nothing. Um, but if the outer thing is just, well, it's, then it's whatever the inner thing is, um, is the value of of the result. If the other thing is nothing, we still got nothing. If the other thing is a just three, we have just three, for example. Um, and uh, with writer, where we have these strings, we get a concatenation of the strings. We sort of flatten the strings by concatenating them, much as we concatenated these lists up here, appended the list. With power set, we take the union. We sort of crunch together all these sets and the set of 
sets. Um, we, we take all the sets within that outer set and we, we union them together. Or the probability distribution, we take the weighted average of the inner distributions um, and, and so on. Okay, so last time, um, so, so this is mu. And this will take us to, to this issue of, um, of the interaction of, of eta and mu. Mu is our multiplication. It takes a list of lists. It takes list and list, and it turns into a list. It takes maybe and maybe, and it turns it into a maybe. It takes writer and writer, it turns it into a writer. Um, it takes, in other words, two things, and it turns it into one. Kind of like multiplication takes two numbers, and it turns it into one. Um, now, you might think it's doing it in kind of a funky way, right? It's taking a list of lists and turning it to lists. It's not normally what we think of as multiplication. Um, um, fair enough, it, it stretches intuition a bit, uh, but um, you can think of it uh, in this way as, as, as forming um, multiplication of sorts. Um, it's taking a T squared of A and turning it into a T of A. So T of T of A into T of A. Um, okay, now any adjunction we had talked about um, uh, several lectures ago is associated with a set of triangle equalities. And um, these triangle equalities reflect these natural transformations that are guaranteed to exist in adjunctions right here. Um, and um, uh, these natural transformations are, as we, as I alluded to earlier, ensured to exist by virtue of the fact that these HOM sets are isomorphic, in fact, naturally isomorphic. Um, so by virtue of the fact there's a self arrow here on LD, it induces a, um, it, we know, because there's at least one morphism going from LD to LD, at least the identity morphism, we know that there's um, a natural transformation from D to RLD, which is D to T. D to takes a, a value like an int and it turns it into a monadic value, like a list of ints, like that singleton list or a set of ints, just, a, just that element three in a set or a maybe a just of three. Um, that's what this is. And uh, it turns out there's this eta as well that by exactly the same argument, the other way has to exist over here as a natural transformation. This one goes from a, from a monadic value to an element. So we'll go from a list, for example, down to a, to a, to a single, single element, it extracts it, extracts it from there. Um, Okay, now from this, from this property uh, and, and set of properties associated with this, uh, there's natural transformations that pop out. And in the adjunctions lecture, I, um, I talked about why these pop out, um, how they uh, have to be the case given the definition of eta and so on. And um, we wrote them as is the standard within category theory um, in a rather terse type of fashion. So we wrote them in a way that, that makes use of this notation, which can be somewhat confusing. And I want to unpack this here, OK? So you'll recall that in an adjunction context, we have these, this left functor and a right functor. So we have category D over here, category C over here. And uh, we have mappings between them defined by the left functor and the right functor that observe certain uh, adjunction uh, rules. And particularly, there's this, uh, this isomorphism between these, these home sets for any old C and any old D. Now, uh, 
when we characterize these these triangle equalities, they pop out of this monadic context, but we write them in this notation that I want to explicate a bit. So on the on the uh, nodes, these kind of uh, vertices here, uh, corners as it were of the um, of the triangle, what we have are functors, okay, um, and and so uh, we have a functor R. That's a functor going from C to D, for example. Uh, but it's composed here with uh, a, a another functor, which is um, ID on D. So that will just take any old any old object in D and map it to itself. Any any morphism in D map to itself. So this is a functor ID on D. It's a particularly sort of trivial functor or 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 boring functor or uh, sort of uh, uh, basic functor. And I've written it here because we can append it on to any functor that goes to category D. I can always append on after it host compose it, you know, after it is that first functor is composed, I can stick out an ID of D. And based on that, we're going to apply a natural transformation. And this is where it gets notationally confusing and sometimes conceptually confusing. Ada horizontally composed with R. Now, R here is horrible. I mean, this is horrible notation. No, horrible, um, but it's the standard. And so I, I've got to inoculate you against it. Um, so R here is an identity natural transformation. Okay, so this was an, this was an identity functor. So this, this kind of went, remember functors go from categories to categories. So it went, you know, um, it took every uh, object in this category to itself. This is an identity natural transformation. Remember, natural transformations map between functors. They map fun functor to functor. They take, where's my natural transformation thing? Here it is. A natural transformation takes how one functor maps an object and it takes it to where the other functor maps it, right? It maps the hand of the human to the paw of the dog. Um, and and it, it tells us, you know, how one functor maps something versus how another does by, by delineating the, the mappings between them as, as morphisms. That's what a natural transformation does. So a natural transformation maps from functor to functor. And R here, you look at it here, it's a functor. It's a, it's a functor, but it's being written to actually mean it's the natural transformation um, mapping R to R, okay? So this R is retained. It doesn't go anywhere. It's not mapped to another functor. It's just, it's just R. It just stays as R. That's that R. Um, by contrast, ID, if you take eta and you apply it to ID, so think of it this way, and we'll get to this with natural uh, horizontal composition. This R is preserved. We, we just map it with an identity transformation to this one. This ID of D, well, we, we, that's a functor, and we, we are going to apply eta to it. And what's eta's job in life? Well, eta's job in life is to take ID of D. Hey, that's this guy. It can eat this. And what does it spit out? It spits out R after L. Oh, there it is, R after L. So that's where that came from. From this eta, we produced it by eating this D, ID of D, and this R just stuck there, um, like a bump on a log. It just stuck there, okay? Um, and uh, so, so this is, um, in fact, a pairing of these, which is why these things can operate on, on each of them. Um, and, uh, we have this eta eating L and R and, and putting out ID of C and, and 
RL goes there. Now, the way these things are boiled down, they just put R and R here. And you're supposed to know that, yeah, 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 yeah there's another functor there. Yeah, there's an identity functor. You know, it gets, it gets processed by that. Um, so this is kind of confusing, but it's best to think of these things explicitly as there, and you'll understand these triangle equalities better. Now, this lecture is not about triangle equalities in adjunctions, but it is going to be about horizontal composition and natural composition. And what you're seeing is, I hope, a, a handy heuristic to think about horizontal transformation of natural, um, horiz horizontal composition of natural transformations. Uh, if, you, if you write this out as a composition of functors, you can think about each component of this horizontal um, uh, composition of natural transformation is it's applying to each of those functors in turn. So eta applies to IDD. IDD is a functor and eta turns that functor. Eta is a natural transformation that turns that functor into this functor. So it, it just acts on that. This is the identity um, natural transformation and it acts on this to give the same thing back. It maps functor to functor here, it's trivial mapping from that functor R to itself. Okay, so if you think about the natural transformation that's a horizontal composition of natural transformations and you pair it with corresponding ones of a composition of functors, you'll, you'll be in pretty good shape for understanding what's going on. So this is adjunctions. These are the triangle equalities, but it's a bit dense and I wanted to explicate it. Now we're gonna see how these apply to monads. Okay, now for monads, we basically get the triangle equalities give us the monad laws. They give us the monad laws. They just do it with a bit of a twist. Mathematicians like these twisty things you may have learned. Um, okay, so to, to, to find out this, look, all we do is we, here's our, here's our terse view of the triangle equalities from an adjunction. If we post-compose this one with L, we stick L at the end of everything. It turns out that sometimes in math, you build things up so you can simplify, right? And, and R after L going, going R and then going with L, um, uh, R and then L um, is going to give us, excuse me, R and then L is going to give us, in fact, a, um, uh, a this, that's in fact what the monad is. It's, it's uh, R after L right up here. Um, so that round trip, um, which is is going uh, from right? It's R after L, and so it's we we go first with L, and then we go with R. That will give us our monad, um, and that monad we're calling T. Okay, so so in an adjunction context, the monad pops out of R after L, and eta is going to be something that takes in a, a value and puts it into the monad here. So this is T, this is T here. And each of these boils down, each of these pairs of R and L boil down to T and T. So, so here we get T um, and, uh, and uh, T composed with T and, and T. And this is our monad law. This, this thing right here uh, is mu. Uh, this is the definition of mu. Uh, some may recall me covering that in the previous lecture. And this turns into these RLs turn into T. So we have eta composed with T. So, so these, these adjunction laws turn into the monad laws here. And you get a similar thing with post-composing with R here. You, you basically put R on each side over here and you get, you get this law. But I wanna explicate this a little bit more. Um, so you go from monad adjunction triangle equalities to monad laws, but this could be a little bit opaque. So I wanna, I wanna take this last one and I want to, to sort of 
explain it a little bit more in concrete terms. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, so we have these two laws. These are two of the three monad laws. There's another one with associativity, okay? Um, uh, these two are, are uh, coming out of the triangle equalities. And they basically say how eta interacts with mu. And that eta is an identity. Um, it's the unit element of, of uh, when mu is considered as multiplication. Um, so if mu, we're considering this as a monoid where we have t times t, and if it's time, if one of those elements is eta, we'll get back the other element. Um, just like three times one, we get back three. Whatever we have times one, we'll get back the other thing. So it is with, uh, with eta and mu. Mu is multiplication and, and eta is, is unit. Now, um, le let's, let's consider it though, because there's two twists of this. Um, and I want to make this concrete. Uh, to the degree I can. So T here is a monad. It's a monad. Okay. Um, so T over here uh, might be something like if we think about T applied to a component, I think this might be a list of events. Okay. So list events. There we go. It's a list event. So maybe it's two, three, five. Um, now, if we have two, three, five uh, here, we can, it turns out that, that uh, we, we have two things that are guaranteed to be equal to two, three, five um, that, that result from this eta and mu. One thing we can do, and this is important, we can take two, three, five and we can place it into, we can take the, um, the, the the two three five and we can call eta on it considering it as an element of 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 this uh, this uh, list of ints okay so it's a, it's a list of ints and we can call eta on a list of ints and eta's job in life is to take in an element and inject it into the monadic domain so eta here will take in two three five and it will say, just like eta would take in three and it would produce a list of just three, a singleton list of just three here, will take two, three, five, the list, and it will create a list of just the list two, three, five, okay? Um, so here we're applying eta to the entire value two, three, five as a list, okay? And, and we're applying eta at sort of two, three, five. That's the component of eta that's going from the list two, three, five to the list consisting of just, just the, single, the singleton list consisting of just the list two, three, five. And so this is what we get out, two, three, five. There we go. Um, that's what eta does, okay? Um, and uh, that's, that's nice. Uh, we can do the same thing with power set, for example. So here we'd be, this is the set two, three, five, and we could consider that set as a whole and use eta at that set two, three, five, taking that in, taking it in two, three, five as a set, and we can apply it. And eta's job in life is to take in something and pack it up as a singleton set. And so it would take that list two, three, five, and it would pack it up as a singleton list two, three, five within a bigger list. There we go. Okay, that's what we have here. That's what this thing is. Great. And now mu. Well, what's mu gonna do? Well, well, look, mu does different things for different monads, right? We saw that here. So for a list, it flattens the list. It just takes concatenates everything within that list. Well, everything in the list is two, three, five. So it turns it back into two, three, five. It's the only thing there. And that's the same as this one. That's the long equality sign, right? 
235, 235 list. It's the same thing. It's guaranteed to be the same thing. How about power set? Well, what is the what does set do? Well, look for set. Well, um, uh, we take the union. So we take the union of this and we get out, oh, take the union of all the sets within this outer set. Well, the union is just 235, and that's guaranteed to be the same. That's one way we could preserve 235, get back to it involving mu. We inject it with eta and we use mu to collapse them down, to multiply, um, collapse the list of lists into just a list or collapse a set of sets into just a set. Um, but eta has guaranteed, the fact that it's unit is guaranteed we get the same thing back. Okay, that's nice, but that's not the only way we can do things. After all, look, we have a set two, three, five here. We could do something more than just inject it into as a singleton, say, into of sets or singleton list. Um, we could do a lot more than that. We could we could lift eta as applied to each darn integer. We could lift that function eta to apply to each element of two, three, five. Right? Uh, say the list. To apply eta. Now, eta's job in life is whatever you give it, it's going to turn into a list of, you know, just that thing, right? Um, or a set of just that thing, or whatever the monad um, eta is. So, if we could lift eta with um, applying as applied to integers using t, and it goes inside. Remember, that's what I said earlier. It goes. You can think of it as going inside, applies element wise to each of these. So if we have the power set, or we have the list two, three, five, and we lift eta applied to integers to it, it's going to create a list of lists. But the list of lists will be different from over here. This list is the list of the list two, singleton list two. And the singleton list three and the singleton list five. So for each of these, it'll turn, it'll produce a singleton list. Why? Because it's applying element wise eta to each of those element. It's lifted eta. It's eta went inside of the list and applied element wise, just like mapping a function to, to a list with F map, it applies it to each element in turn. So here we've applied eta to two. And we get out a singleton list of two. We applied eta to three. We get a singleton list of three. We apply eta to five. We get a singleton list of five. And that's our entire list. That's what said, that's what t, t um, after t means here. Um, same thing with, with this one, right? With the set, we, we inject two to become a singleton set, three to become a singleton set, five to become a singleton set. And we get out a list of singleton sets. Um, here we've lifted eta. Over here we didn't lift eta. Over here we applied eta to the whole stinking list, the whole two, three, five as a whole. And we got out a, a list of just the list two, three, five. Same thing with the set. Here we applied it to each element of that list, and and we got this. Okay, now we're in a pickle, aren't we? because we have something different here. No, no, we're in fine shape. This is just multiplying by the identity on the other side. Um, here we had eta on the left side. Uh, here we have uh, eta on the right hand side. And just like if you multiply any number times one on the right, you get that other number back. If you multiply any number times one on the left, so one's on the left, it will get that other, num that other number back as well. So it is here. So and this is how it has to be to be a valid monad. So if we have this, great, great. Okay, well, so we have this, are we in a pickle? Well, look, remember what the operations are for mu. For list, we flatten it, right? We're gonna flatten all these things. And what do we get out? Through the magic of monads, we get out two, three, five. And that's the same list we started with, phew, okay. So, you know, we rescued victory out of the jaws of defeat, right? Two, three, five, how about for, for sets? It's a cliffhanger, right? Uh, for sets, we have, we have union. 
So we can take the union two, three, five. So each of these subsets, a singleton subset, we could take the union of when we get two, three, five out, and that's what we started with. Oh my gosh. Okay. So so it succeeded. Um, either way you go, it has to succeed with a valid monad here. Um, regardless of whether we lift eta to apply element-wise to each element of the monad, um, and to each of these elements in turn, each of the elements of the set, each of the elements of the list, each of the, you know, the just, the thing in the just for maybe the, the thing in the, the, um, the, the, for the string, for the writer monad, each element of the probability distribution, um, uh, or whether we, whether we um, instead apply eta to the whole thing at once and, and uh, inject that into a T of T, uh, a list of lists, we, we have to get the same thing when we apply mu. Um, so mu uh, and eta here have to have this relationship that if you, if you use one in the context of the other that they, they retain these identities, okay? Um, and uh, you could, you can see it here, you know, written out. And I included some additional ones here, uh, specifically the maybe and the, the probability distribution. Um, so for probability distribution here, we're injecting the whole thing. That's this one. We're injecting the whole thing um, um, as the whole distribution as our singleton distribution. Um, and by contrast, uh, here we're lifting each element of the distribution, like two, to become a distribution on its own with probability one, but that distribution is only a probability point one of occurring. Uh, this one has minus three, has a probability of one of, of occurring, but that distribution as a whole has only this distribution, uh, this probability of occurring. Um, so here we have a distribution over distributions. It's as if, as Paolo Peroni says, you know, it's as if um, in your pocket, you have two coins. One of them is a loaded coin and one of them is a fair coin. And you're gonna reach in and grab one of those coins out and flip it. Um, which distribution you get, which, whether it's a fair distribution or a loaded one is itself defined by distribution associated with you grabbing the, the coin out. Um, but, Regardless of whether we get this or this, they have to collapse to the same thing when we apply mu. Wait, yes, question. Yeah, I'm just wondering, is this distinct from the concept of a joint distribution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Uh, a joint distribution, um, although mu is called join, it's a different notion of, of, um, of, of joint and um, uh, it is different. Um, uh, a joint distribution would be um, if we have different random variables, let's say X and Y, and we have a probability distribution which specifies simultaneously for every pair of X and Y, um, what possible value, uh, what, what probability um, um, obtains for that. I'm dealing with, with probability mass functions, not probability density functions in my description, simplified description here. But basically, like if you have a um, one, one, one random variable, it could be, um, um, it could take on values A and B, um, and the other could take on values, you know, uh, uh, one, two, three, or something like that. Um, uh, there's a question of what's the probability of getting, um, a uh, with uh, paired with um, um, with an outcome of, of three. So it's like your, uh, or what's the probability of getting B with an outcome of one? So it's like you're you're assessing the probability of getting simultaneously a value for each of the possible random variables, and and that's different than just having a probability for each of A, B, and C separately. So A and B separate from the probability of uh, one, two, and three separately. Now it turns out that probability monads, um, if you watch all of uh, Paolo's talk, uh, can 
reason about this relationship between um, uh, joint distributions and marginal distributions, and um, where marginals are these ones that only apply to one variable at a time. And uh, it's a rather nice result that gets into this join, this join issue, in fact, and multiplication. Um, there's, um, there's a nice relationship there, but this is, this is different. Where, and it might seem like, because we have a list of lists or distribution of distributions, it might seem like the same thing, but it's, um, uh, this, this doesn't approach the issue of joint distribution quite yet. Okay. So thank, thank you. you for the question. Yeah. Okay. Any other question about this? Maybe we'll just open that up to, to questions here. Any other questions? So I've also given a kind of end-to-end -end characterization here. And I use two different notations that you see at different, different times. I'll probably combine these into a single table. Um, OK, now, uh, hearing no questions right now, um, I want to remind you that we've been dealing with these natural transformations. And um, natural transformations are articulating. Um, so there's a natural transformation between functors when they, in some sense, mirror common structure. Um, it's not that they are exactly the same. One could be coarser than the other, for example. But there's a nice lawful mapping between them that is consistent. Um, and it specifically has to do with this, you know, when um, we can undertake an operation. So uh, natural transformation maps, how one functor handles things to how another functor handles things, and particularly how where the first functor maps objects to where the second functor maps objects. And for each of those, there's this component that maps from where that object is mapped by the first thing versus where that object is mapped by the second thing, right? And um, you have a picture of a human and a picture of a dog, and you map the hand of the human to where the hand is for the dog, um, the paw for the dog, I should say. Um, so, so here, um, or the you know, mouth of the human to the mouth of the dog. Um, so there's a component for each of these um, um, that says, where does, where is it mapped by the first thing, by the rendition of the human versus the rendition for the dog. Now, with a, for it to be natural, it has to be the case that for any old function, any function f, um, you can either start with the original functor, say, sorry, start on the, um, on, on the side of the first functor, apply the func that function there to that functor, and then translate over via the natural transformation to the other functor, or translate first and then apply the, the function there. They have to kind of interpret this function in a way that's consistent between them. Um, that either way you go needs to give, well, the same result. That's that's the idea that uh, with an actual transformation, um, f and g have to be similar enough that regardless of whether you apply f on the f side of lowercase f on the function on the f side of functor f side of things or on the functor g side of things, um, they both uh, yield the same result um, when you're going back and forth between these functors. Okay, um, or going from F to G, I should say. Um, and this is very powerful because this has to hold for all Fs. And um, 
the presence of a natural transformation is telling us that you know there's some some common structure being being captured here um and so we might have safe head for example right um and um is negative as our mapping from int to bool and we can either take an int whoa take an uh, take a list event and immediately extract with safe head to get a maybe event um that's our natural transformation that's our component of our natural transformation at int that's what the a is there it says how to go from a list event to a maybe event um and it does so by extracting the first element if it exists otherwise it's nothing right so it's just if the first element if that first element is in the list it has that list has the first element otherwise it it's nothing great so we could do that and then we could map on maybe is this negative and get a maybe a bool was that first element negative right um that's the only thing in the maybe alternatively we could apply is negative to all the elements of the list in turn bum 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 um and and then do safe head on that and get back a bool uh, a maybe a bool and those two have to have the same results for this to be a legitimate natural transformation and we said that in haskell for parametrically defined polymorphic functions in other words a function where there's a certain fixed rule um for um for its mapping regardless of the type you know int or bool or whatever it's not ad hoc defined for different types this is guaranteed and i noted in an earlier lecture this affords us transformations that allow for optimizing the program because instead of mapping is negative over the entire list we can simply extract the first element ask if it's negative and get something that's provably the same um now having reviewed natural transformations so i want to talk about this sticky issue of composition um so natural transformations are these mappings between functors they tell how to translate from how one functor maps things to how another functor maps things um and um we're going to talk about two two types of natural transformations that are extremely common um the first is what's called vertical composition okay so here we have functor f and functor g uh and functor well okay so we have uh functors uh f and g um and and h okay and we have a composition uh sorry we have natural transformations that go from f to g that natural transformation is called alpha so it's translating from f to g right um and it's a natural transformation so it guarantees the naturality so if we have a natural transformation from f to g and if we have a separate one from g to h okay um then we can compose the natural transformations not the functors the natural transformations to go from f to h okay that's the idea of vertical transmission now note that both of these are between the same two categories that really should have been obvious and in fact it's so glaring a gap that i need to remedy it right now using my secret uh cache of uh symbols here um okay so i'm going to i'm going to stick in a um um a nice little c there and this is going to be category c and over here will be category d on the other side um so these categories are the same all of these functors f g h all map between the same two categories okay um here we go and let's just get our d in there and we'll be done okay um yeah that's a big big gap okay um so so this is vertical 
uh, composition. Okay, now vertical composition is is um, you know a fairly natural notion. Um, it's vertical composition between natural transformations, and conceptually, at at the programming level, it corresponds to composition of polymorphic functions and here they're guaranteed to be natural if they're parametrically polymorphic mapping between the same two categories so you might have like uh, um hask c c and d b hask okay and and so maybe a pair to list um that's one natural transformation and you have a uh, safe head that goes from list to um to a and or to maybe of a and you can compose them um, safe head after you perform pair to list, uh, list and list, these things compose um, because the, the outcome of, of this one is the input of the other. And so um, you could get a, a composition of them. That would be a, a parametrically defined polymorphic function that maps, um, that takes one natural transformation and composes it with another natural transformation in this sort of way. Um, okay, and this sort of vertical trans, uh, uh, composition is is actually written with a with a dot commonly. Okay, so it's a it's a smaller dot, not the the big round circle, which would be um, reserved for horizontal uh, composition of natural transformations. So here, three functors going from C to D. We have um, natural transformations between pairs of them, F to G and G to H. And we can compose those natural transformations in a natural way to um, yield something that's guaranteed to be a natural transformation, uh, beta after alpha. It's not just any old mapping, it's a natural transformation. And component-wise, what, what it looks like is this. Um, so we have C and D here. We have three different functors, F, G, and H. And I've, in this diagram, and this will be different in, 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 for a horizontal, I've labeled in the same color things extending from the same object. So the red are all from object A, B, or, you know, blue are all from object B. Um, and Probably next time I I offer these slides, I'll I'll, I'll flip it around. But um, here we have three functors f, g, and h, just like we have these. <clears throat> and so each of them maps from c to d. Here's c, here's d. And so f maps a onto f a, g maps it onto g a, and h onto h a. Um, and the natural transformations from F to G, like alpha, are components shown here. From FA to FG, we have alpha A. Great. And similarly, for GA to HA, we have beta A. Great. Um, but these things also map B. Um, and for example, B is shown over here. Um, and they map F as well. So capital F maps any function F. And so here, or morphism in general. So it maps F to, to be something between F of A and F of B. And G maps it between G of A and G of B. Great. Now, what's shown here in a long dash line is F actually beta after alpha applied on A. So that's this one here. That's the component of that for A is what's shown here. It's just the results of, comp of, of uh, composing this morphism, alpha A, which is guaranteed to exist if there's a natural transformation from F to G, and beta A, which is guaranteed to exist if there's a natural transformation from G to H. Um, Again, beta's job in life is to, to translate from G, how G treats things to how H treats things. Alpha's job in life is to translate from how F, F treats things to how G treats things. And 
The composition of them is beta after alpha vertically composed. Um, and it's at A because it's that's the component of it. Remember, we write these things for natural transformations, the component, how this says, I'm going to tell you how F treats, how to, how to translate from how F treats A into how G treats A. That's, that's what the A encodes here. It's that component of the natural transformation. That's what alpha A is. Um, and that's what beta after alpha vertically composed sub A is. It, it says, I'm going to tell you how to translate from how F handled it to how H handled it. Great. And the same thing with, with B over here. All right. And all these things have to compose, have to commute nicely. They, because they're natural transformations, they have to commute. And, and these guys here have to have to commute as well for it to be natural transformation. Uh, you have to be able to go like this way, whoa, to go like this way and down or uh, via this curvy arrow, or you could go this way and this way and over, or you could go, you know, this way and over, and they all, they're all going to compose in, in order for it to be a, a valid natural transformation. But it, um, it will be a, a valid natural transformation. Okay, so that's vertical, vertical composition of natural transformations. Um, completely straightforward in Haskell. Compose them together as functions. Great. Great. Okay. Um, but now let's take a look at horizontal, which will be thornier, more textured. Okay. Now, vertical involved, so vertical involved two categories. And so we have F going from and G and H, each of them going from one category to the other category pair of categories. Here, with horizontal composition, we have a more nuanced issue. We have three categories. We have F and we have G, but they F goes from C to D and G goes from D to E. Mm. And we have a natural transformation that goes from F to F prime. Mm. And we have another natural transformation that goes from G to G prime. Mm. Um, and what we're interested in doing with our horizontal composition is to, to be able to translate one way, one way from going from C to E, category C to E, all this distance, say G after F, um, taking G after we took F, if you want F fat semi G, um, F followed by G, uh, we want to translate from that to this other way of getting from C to E, which is F prime after it should be G prime after F prime. Mm. Because we can get to it this way, or we can get to it this way. And look, we know how to get from F to F prime. And we know how to get from beta uh, via beta from G to G prime. So surely we should be able to get from G after F to G prime after F prime. But how are we going to do that? Um, so now we're trying to deal with this whole round, this whole sort of, um, you know, one after the other trying to get over here. Okay, well, here it's, it's getting a, a bit busy. I was up late last night um, um, doing this. <laughs> this, is, this is not for the, um, this, this is not a, uh, an exercise that, that uh, you could do um, while multitasking. Um, okay, so uh, what I've, what I've done here is, is to draw in component wise what's going on, okay? And um, so here we have category C, category D, category E. That's each of these categories. Um, here we start with C. And look, we, we can go from C to D with either F or F prime. And I've colored them in similar colors. Um, 
sort of red versus orange to, to have a certain huatic consistency um, or something. So um, uh, here we have C1 mapped with F and C2 mapped with F and we have C1 mapped with F prime and, and, and um, map uh, and the same thing with C2. And uh, we know that there's a natural transformation alpha between them. So we know there's a, there's guaranteed to be a, um, a path here, which will make this diagram commute. And, uh, and it commutes because we can either, it's as a natural transformation, we can, if we wanna go from FC, FC1 to F prime C2, we can either go um, uh, this way, we can apply capital F to, to a function F to get to FC2 and then take the natural transformation from FC, from FC2 that this, the job of this natural transformation is to translate from F to how F handles thing, a certain thing to how F prime handles that same thing. So this will translate from F handle C2 to how F prime handle C2. And alternatively, we could go over on C1 and come down. Okay, that's great. That's great. Um, so that's uh, that's F prime. But then you know the plot thickens. Um, the plot thickens here. So um, here we have uh, over an E now. For each of these guys, we have two ways of mapping it with G and G prime, right? We can, now we're in D safely. We can, we got to get over to E and we can go either with G or G prime. So each of these guys, oh man, they're, get, they're gonna be brought over. So, so these guys here are brought over there. These gals here are brought over here. And, um, and that's not just with G. So this whole side is like the G side and this is like the G prime side. And so, these ones are brought over with G prime. And, and I note with a certain degree of pride, the, the again, the color consistency here. So these are light and dark blue. Um, and and the, the colors denote whether the, which, with which functor they're mapped, okay? Okay, okay, so here we have the G prime and here we have the G, yeah. Um, okay, um, well, that wasn't horrible, but we, we just gotta, Label it right, like G applied to FC one is going to be G FC one. Yeah. It's just G mapping FC one. Uh, G applied to F prime C one is going to be G F prime C one. And there's natural transformations between these because we know how to get with an alpha over here from F of something to F prime of something. And um, uh, and and so here. For example, there's a mapping from GFC1 to GF prime C1. That's just the lifting, the lifting of alpha with G. Because remember, you lift alpha with G, it'll be applied to each element of, of, of the G, right? Um, it'll be applied under the G. And, uh, and so it will map GF C1 to GF prime C1. It'll the alpha turns the f's into f primes, so it will, it'll, it'll map that way, and so this will turn gfc two into gf prime c two. Okay, okay, so that's our natural transformation alpha. Now notice I, I labeled in different uh, styles of lines that first natural transformation. This is the sort of long dashes, but then there's the dotted ones, which are the second natural transformation. That's the beta. Okay, uh, there we go, betas, there are the betas here. Um, take a look at that. Okay, so we got these betas and these betas are gonna go, as you might think, from the G area to the G prime area, because that's what G does, that's what beta does. It translates G things into G prime things. And so here we have, and, and it's beta. So it's like beta at FC1, oh man, translates, so that translates the job of beta in life is to translate a G of something to a G prime of something. So this translates G F C one into G prime of F C one, right? And, and similarly beta F prime C one translates a G of F prime C one into a G prime of F prime C one. Oh man. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, 
and the same thing holds too for these C2s. Okay, okay, so, so, so we have these natural transformations that are kind of orthogonal to one another. But then what our job in life is, remember our, our goal here was to get from G after F to G prime after F prime. Have we gotten anywhere with this? Well, the good news is, yeah, we did. So we want to translate for any, that's what beta after alpha is with this big circle. See, we go through all this work and we get a nice bigger circle than we do with natural transformations. You get a bigger compose here. So um, beta after alpha with horizontally composed, um, it's going to consist of a set of components. And each of those components will say how beta after alpha vert uh, horizontally composed will be handling different particular values. So one of these components is C1. So this is going to tell us how to go from G after F of C1 to G prime after F prime of C1, right? That's what that's what the components of beta, beta after so um, beta ver, uh, horizontally composed with alpha are. Um, it's the component for C1. It's going to map from this guy GFC1 to GF prime C1, and same thing for C2. That's what this one is. So this this natural transformation, or this is the component of beta horizontally composed with alpha at C1. That's the C1 component. Its job in life is to say how GF handles things to go from how GF handles things to how G prime F prime handles things. Okay, that's what that is. It, it, it's the Rosetta Stone. It translates from how GF handles things to GF prime handles things. And there's one of those for each of these, these sort of C1s and C2s here. Um, so we get out. Yeah, a set of these, and, and you can read off. I mean, this one has to commute. And so all these things have to be the same. So you can either go to get there. Well, we can either lift alpha and then shift beta, as Bartos says, to, to apply at F prime C1, because um, we're going from F prime C1 here um, to, to get up here. Um, that's one way to get this mapping. Another way is to go up here with beta FC1 and then lift alpha using G prime. That's another way to get there. Um, all those are equivalent. Um, they're equivalent. And they're all written down here. The one Bartosz gave, I think, was this, um, uh, was this first one here. Um, so uh, alpha is lifted and beta is shifted here. Um, uh, but uh, again, you could, uh, you could do it in the flip, uh, flip direction here. And it's kind of a um, functional programming challenge. He, he, Bartosz poses it in, in his lectures nicely as this uh, functional programming uh, problem, right? Where, look, you, you, have, um, you have something which um, goes, from uh, f of c to f prime of c, and you have that's alpha, and you have a beta which goes from g of d to g prime of d, and now you want to get something that goes from g of f of something of c to g prime of f of of c, and and the idea is look, um, okay, if we so if we have this, well, you know, this kind of looks a little bit like we could lift alpha because after all, alpha takes an F of C, we could lift it with G, right? But if we lift alpha, we'll get something that takes in a G of F with G. If we lift alpha with G, if we F map alpha um, using G, um, it'll take a, a, a G of F of C um, and uh, it will give out a G of F prime of C, but what we want is a G prime of F prime of C. Um, so how are we gonna get that? Well, beta gives that a, a way to get, go from a G of any old D to a G prime of any old D. So we can take beta of that result to get, um, to get this. And so by composing them, we get this exact uh, thing that we saw here in this horrible form. Um, so if you saw Bartosz's lecture, that's, um, that's how he emphasized doing it and it, it works quite well. 
Now, there's two special cases of this that um, he mentioned. Um, one is where we have only one. So we instead of having two uh, natural transformations, we're only dealing with one. But first, like we do F here to go from C to D. Um, so alpha is essentially the identity natural transformation. And we want to go from now G, G after F to G prime after, well, it used to be F prime, but here it's F because um, there's no, no F prime. Um, uh, F is F prime. So um, F prime is F, I should say. So, so here um, we want to go from, 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 from this guy uh, here, G after F to G prime after, um, uh, after F. And we can do it um, if we if we look at that. It actually simplifies this this horrid diagram simplifies to this, um, and uh, you can kind of read off uh, what the elements are here. But basically, um, uh, we we want to go like take gf gf c prime to gf prime um, uh, to to gf to g prime f c one, and um, that's just, uh, it turns out, can be accomplished by uh, beta uh, FC1, okay? That's the beta FC1 uh, here. So, so in short, it's, um, uh, it's just given by a beta shifted um, to apply at, uh, at F of, of, an, of a given object. So, so if you wanna know the component for a given object C, uh, all we have to consider is beta at f of c. So we 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 take f f f has already mapped c to f c, and we take beta at f c. Great, um, and that's that's sort of this this mapping from g f to g prime after f, um, and uh, it comes out of the functional programming um, phrasing of it. Post composing, sorry, pre composing. So if we have alpha first and then G, um, uh, and we want to translate between these two, we can do so again with a simplified diagram. And basically, all it is is we lift alpha. So G just lifts alpha um, to, to apply to go from G after F to G prime after F prime, or sorry, to G after F prime. Um, so all we do is we lift alpha. alpha. Alpha's job in life is to map from F to F prime. So all we do is we lift it with G and we get our, our solution to go from GFC to GF prime C, um, which kind of makes sense. Well, all it is is, is lifted um, right there. So, so these are kind of special cases where we're taking it before and we shift beta um, to apply at the results of where F mapped objects. Or here we, we want to post compose with G. And so all we do is we lift alpha with G. So it applies on G things. Um, and it goes from G after F to G after F prime. Um, OK. Um, yeah. So I think I will leave it there um uh we we will next time be talking more about these interchangeable ways of specifying monads and um look at some examples of this um now that we've paid off that tech debt um we're going to see how um really there's three ways the first is one inspired by what we've been working with here we have mu and ada I should really say eta here. Um, uh, that's that's one way um, that we might specify things. Um, another way we might specify things would be with Kleisley arrows and and uh, Kleisley composition operator. And so that's this uh, fish operator, um, which is uh, shown there, um, uh, which goes from takes two effectful functions, um, effectful function one can return monadic values to, to be T and another one. And it composes them to create another one that takes in, takes in a standard element and uh, returns a single effect that captures both of these. 
and uh, ADA return. And then uh, there's bind and flat map, which sort of takes the output from this guy and applies this guy to it to get, a, uh, to get an MC. Um, and it sort of short circuits the whole taking an A component of it. Um, so we'll, uh, uh, we'll be talking about those next time and see how they apply for a number of monads. Um, both, both the ones we've concentrated on thus far for, for a little bit more uh, ease of understanding things like the list monad, the maybe monad, the set monad, the distribution monad. But we'll look at how they apply to things like the state monad or the, the reader monad, where um, we're dealing with functions um, and returning and at higher order functions rather than turning sets or, or distributions or, or lists. So, so that's what we'll do next time um, and expand this to understand some of the practical sides of monads. So thank you very much. Thank you for your accommodation of the later schedule today. And I will look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, this day is uniquely bad for me because of a big deadline um, tonight uh, that I have to deliver on for our federal partners. Um, but uh, I hope all of you have a uh, good holiday weekend, uh, get to take some time off, and uh, I will look forward to, uh, to seeing you on next Wednesday. Thanks very much. Take care there. Thank you.